Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're coming from. Uh, my name is Don Lee. Um, we're going to be talking about terrains today. So the um, purpose of this uh, is to essentially make you um, comfortable with the uh, open roads environment. So let's uh, start with our discussion here on the uh, terrains themselves. So um, the purpose, as I said, is, is uh, to provide you with information and just generally best practices uh, working with terrain models. We're going to see these get used, you know, as, as many of us might start uh, engaging Connect more and more. We'll see MicroStation uses them as well as Open Roads, Rail, Site, and many of the solutions that are out there. Um, but it's definitely one item that's overlooked by users. So I want to encourage you to, uh, uh, you know, investigate these further and hopefully you get a couple of tips out of this today. So what we're going to talk about first and foremost is what is a terrain? What makes it up? We're going to take a look just briefly at, you know, some feature definitions and symbology, um, what a feature type is. Um, not going to go through every single feature type, but we're going to talk about the ones that I think most people tend to overlook and then really how we can, you know, understand them looking at their element information. And then from that point, we're going to go through some live uh, activities here. I'm going to do some tips and tricks and discuss uh, best practice workflows. Um, there's a lot of things that users tend to uh, leave out um, when they're thinking about terrains. Um, a lot of times we cobble them together and we, we really don't understand that they have different needs and different stages of our, of our uh, design, of our work. And then lastly, I'll just finish up with some notes. So what is a terrain model? Well, generically speaking, um, it's essentially a set of three-dimensional triangles and the key indicator here, the key thing I want you to think about when we talk about terrains is that they're mathematically computed. So soak on that, think about that, because that's going to have some impacts as we work through our designs in the way it uses our computers. So if we understand that these are mathematically computing, um, we can certainly do some things to get performance increases uh, out of our solutions um, you know, as we visit this through each stage of our design. Now, we collect this uh, from point data, and essentially, more or less, it helps us build that surface. So you get three points, you get a triangle, you get a triangle, you get a surface. And the more points you have, the more triangles, the more undulations, and the closer to reality as far as the surface is concerned, you're going to get. So it's usually used to define many irregular surfaces, things like ground, you know, the, the earth. Um, but we can also do subsurface geotechnical layers. We can also capture proposed surfaces um, in, our, in our design. Um, so just a lot of various use cases for terrain. So it doesn't just stop on, you know, survey delivering an existing ground surface. It's, it's certainly used in each stage and in many different ways uh, through each of those stages. So we want to take a look at that. Now, terrain models are, are commonly referred to as digital terrain models, or DTMs, triangulated irregular networks, uh, you know, that many users use the term TINs, or just triangulated surfaces. Um, we encourage you guys to, to utilize and start getting comfortable with the term terrain model, as that is, is kind of that, you know, uh, merger of all of those ideas into one solution. So this way we don't have disparities between uh, users from more native uh, legacy products, uh, should I say legacy products. Um, but a terrain model, most importantly, is a microstation element. And so having it as a microstation element gives us a lot of capabilities. Um, as I said, we can use it in the various uh, platform products that we have. Uh, microstation, as well as open roads, open site, etc., and take advantage of it through a reference even. Now, how these terrains are built? Well, we utilize the, the uh, open roads uh, standards uh, kind of breakdown here, and we categorize them as their own object type. So you'll see a category titled terrain. And within that, you know, you can create and, and organize these feature definitions to your liking, different purposes, but more or less, you'll see things like, you know, existing versus proposed. Um, but essentially, it's, it's allowing us to kind of uh, collect and organize um, these uh, terrains as far as uh, uh, their volume classification, maybe even their look, how they present themselves. 
And so we'll offer the idea of a feature definition where you can provide the name, the description, and even a seed name. So as you create more and more of these, they actually you know, uh, iterate with a common name, perhaps, if you have standards that require that. Now, it's important to note you can apply some item types to these as well, like many items, and there's probably a coffee corner in the near future about item types, so look for that. And then there's also the terrain itself and its volume option. Now, it's very, very important to note, especially if you're coming from V8i, that the terrains have been changing through the generations of, of releases, and uh, the volume options you were familiar with in previous releases um, have actually thinned down. And so in Connect Edition, we now utilize design, existing, subgrade, or none as the various volume options for terrain. So if you're coming from an older release and you were using you know, unsuitables or other designations like that as a volume option, uh, just please note when you bring those forward, um, we really encourage you to do uh, meshes with those. So there's a little bit more accuracy um, and a little bit more benefit uh, for some of those uh, volume options in the mesh family. So I encourage you to look there. But uh, certainly want you to be aware that we have volume designators um, to assist us, and that's also for downstream when we cut things like cross-sections. Of course, once we've assigned that feature definition, we can tie it to a certain surface feature symbology. And that surface feature symbology really just allows us some other, other benefits here. You know, how is it going to look when you make that assignment? Maybe we have a uh, presentation um, to just show only existing triangles. It's existing by volume, but we only want to show the triangles or existing by volume, and maybe we only want to see the contours. So we can set up a symbology using element templates to help us manage that look and feel. You know, gone are the days of turning on and off a multitude of levels. We're letting the element templates uh, control that by way of these feature definitions and, and, the, and the symbologies that call on those element templates. Now, in addition to this, and this is something many users overlook, maybe you don't think there's value in assigning a feature definition to your terrain. You just want to see something. You don't, you don't need to worry about that. Well, it's important to note that getting it right in the beginning pays off in the end. And it's very important to note that many terrains can accompany an annotation group with them such that when it's time to do things like your plan and profile sheet cutting, you might get your strip grades for your existing ground across the surface. I'm sure many of us, if we've gone through and maybe didn't assign the right feature definition, we may have seen that. So just realize that setting it right in the earliest of stages of your design is going to help you downstream. And, you know, as the projects change, uh, you know, that could be something that you tend to forget. So highly encourage we set things to the right feature definition um, for our, our purposes here because it'll pay off in the long run. Of course, you can also augment the three-dimensional look and feel of that terrain, uh, but we commonly will utilize a default element template to support both, uh, both uh, plan profile and 3D needs. So that's a little bit about the look, the feel, the makeup of it, and how things are assigned. But explain some of these different feature types. Well, many of us in the industry, I'm going to start with one of the most common. We'll have a surveyor go out in the field, and he takes a survey, and he takes some shots. Those shots are spot shots in many cases. And as he's doing those shots, he's getting the X, Y, Z point. Now, when we get three of those, those spot shots gather into what makes a, a triangle. So you get three, you'll get a triangle, as I stated. And depending on those different offsets and elevations, you know, and as far as coordinate space is concerned, we're going to get that, that surface plane and, and the direction it lists and such. So we'll be able to get slopes. Now, if we think about that, that's one of the most primitive and common things for a terrain. Hopefully we can understand X, Y, Z helps us, on, you know, define the uh, majority of our terrain. But there are some common ones that... Um, or overlooked, I guess, or should be common, should I say. One of them is a soft break line. Many of us know break line. A break line helps us basically take some of the ideas of the spot shots and string along those shots, giving us the ability to really have a hardened, defined, uh, triangulated area. So we can actually, you know, do things like ditches and things like that, or maybe the crown of a road. We can have very 
very hard definitions in, in that surface. So the triangulation doesn't spill over. It's actually adhering to that uh, delineator. But a soft break line, how many of us have had instances where we're working on surfaces and triangles and doing survey? Maybe you have some crossing break lines. Well, soft break line is a really nice, effective capability to kind of make one be a bit subservient. It will actually stand down when the two overlap. So depending on the new unique scenario you might be working with, it allows us to have one brake line be a little bit more subservient to the adjacent brake line. So by changing the status to a soft brake line, sometimes it, it just gives us the ability so we don't have uh, concerns of vertical faces or, or things where we're going to have canopies and it's going to affect the surface, which um, is something we cannot do with surfaces. They violate Delaunay's rule of triangulation. So um, soft brake line, a feature type I encourage you guys to take a look at when you go back to work with terrains yourself. Now another one, hugely overlooked, is the hole. Now a hole is very similar to a void. A void, many of us are familiar with the idea of, you know, maybe the surveyors or the aerial organizations have come back and as they've flown and gotten buildings, they don't want the buildings to be part of the surface because maybe that's going to affect, you know, what, when we cut cross sections, we don't want to see that, you know, uh, shooting up and over to, to cover the top of the building and our cross sections. Maybe we just want to skip it, ignore it and have no influence on the terrain. We could create a void and a void just creates that opening in the surface. But the difference between a hole and a void is quite interesting because a hole operates similar to a void on the terrain you're doing it with. But if you go to merge two surfaces to together, a hole will allow the other surface to fill in the hole. A void infinitely just leaves a, a void throughout all mergers of surfaces. So if you've got two, one's got a void, one doesn't, and they overlap, it will uh, actually continue to cut a hole through those surfaces. So hole allows you to set an opening in your active surface, but a void is for all surfaces regardless. So just keep that in mind. Now a drape boundary, another common feature that's overlooked. Many of us need to trim the extents of our, our surface, and we might not know the exact elevation all the way around it. A drape boundary gives us the ability to establish a boundary where only the X and Y values are being used, and it actually just slices up or down and cuts through that surface to help understand what the Z value should be by way of the X, Y. So really, the drape boundary has no influence directly on the elevations, and it's very useful when you need to clean up the exterior edges of a, a surface. Now, and again, that same principle goes over to avoid. Maybe I have an area I just need to exclude and I don't know the elevations. I can draw the shape. Maybe I'm using an aerial. I can see on the aerial that that needs to be, uh, you know, overlooked or ignored. I can just draw the shape and assign it as a drape void and it will slice a hole through the surface and interpret the Z from the existing adjacent spot shots around that surface. Now we get into a few more. I'm not going to read every single feature type here. But a break void is also similar in that fact. Um, if you assign a break void versus a void or a drape void, it's actually going to use the line work as well to affect that Z value. So in some cases, you, you have a very explicit uh, linear element and you want to uh, you know ensure that the triangulation follows along the edge of that line. A break void will give you a little bit more definition as well. So void, break void, and drape void. Uh, you know, depending on your needs, each of them can, can certainly uh, uh, cover those. And then the last one I want to offer, let's imagine I used a project where I aerially flew a, uh, a bridge and I've got a big river and I've got to get both, you know, the east and west side of the river. Uh, I need that land, but I don't want the river to be involved. Well, I would set that riverbank as a whole, so I would just ignore that, and I'd still be able to get the east and west sides of this river. However, uh, maybe I've got a landmass in the middle, and I still want triangulation for that. Well, we can assign that as an island, and it allows us to create kind of an interior terrain within that that hole. So island can be worked worked with uh, within those areas, and uh, essentially assigning it as such 
Uh, it's very useful for things like if you've got bridge piers with land masses, things like that, um, you can assign that uh, edge of that island. And hopefully the definition or the name of it is pretty clear as to what its purpose does and what it results in. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.